Apparently we're live and we're recording now. Hello, everybody. We were waiting for one more panelist. It's coming right on. But anyway, welcome to our panel at the Horasis 2021 Global Visions Conference. My name is Isabel Maxwell, and it's my honor and pleasure to moderate. to arrange a medical visit or to meet a teacher, how to support left behind non-users and how to scale trust to promote digital inclusion. This is a lot to talk about in 45 minutes, allowing for introductions and possible questions, we hope. So let's get stuck right in. The theme of harasses for this conference is America and the rebuilding of trust. And that is a critical element to address for the elderly too. I'm going to use the government's definition of elderly as those of its population who are over 65. And thank you to Frank and Harassis for providing an opportunity for us to speak about this today. First, I'm going to introduce our panel, and then I'm going to give some introductory words and some, some statistics and thoughts of my own, leading to my opening question to each of the panelists to kick off the discussion. So now to the introductions, and please just raise your hand so the online audience can see quickly which of you is which. Constance Wuchheim is the founder and managing partner of iPotentials Executive Search and Consultancy. She's regarded as one of the leading experts on organizational architecture. And for 15 years, she's been building and transforming digital teams in the new and old economy. Constance takes a close look at how the business leaders of the digital age inspire trust in customers as well as in the workforce. Florence Mouchon is the founder and CEO of Never Tech Late, in 2019 after completing a fellowship that focused on promoting social entrepreneurship. Never Tech Late advocates the expanded use of technology to enhance the well-being of older adults and promote engagement and lifelong learning. The company developed a state-of-the-art curriculum to teach older, older adults how to use a tablet and a video conferencing program. The core mission of Never Tech Late is to reduce the technical divide which has been rendered even more harmful during the COVID-19 pandemic. And now Dr. Aslan Shikawi is from Algeria, and we're delighted to have him share his perspectives on our panel today. He's chairman since 1993 of an Algeria-based consultancy and studies center, Nor Sud Ventures, which operates as a business entity and think tank. He's a stakeholder in various track two task forces dealing with security in the Mediterranean, and low intensity conflicts in North Africa and the Sahel region. He's a longtime member of the advisory board of the Defense and Security Forum, DSF, London, which is a foreign and defense affairs think tank founded by Lady Olivia Maitland in 1983. And Adrian Lovett, welcome, glad you slid in under the wire there, is the World Wide Web Foundation's president and CEO. The World Wide Web Foundation was founded by web inventor Sir Tim Berners-Lee and Rosemary Leith, and is committed to creating a web that campaigns. I'm going to introduce the topic again so we have it firmly in mind as I make my own brief introductory words and then each panelist We'll speak for about two and a half minutes and then open up the discussion among us from there with, I hope, some questions also from the wider audience here and online. The panel topic is elderly and infirm people in the U.S., as well as people in less developed countries, still have difficulty in gaining digital access. How to help them, how to support the left behind non-users, and how to scale trust to promote ever sharper relief, the lack of digital access to families living in poverty and or regional areas far from any major town or city. And many students are forced to do remote schooling and they're often highly disadvantaged too because they may not have access to a desk computer at home and many libraries where they might go have been closed due to COVID. So I actually think 
that the issues of access and scale and trust too are applicable across all ages and all economies. So we could be thinking about that as we address specifically the elder population today. Here are some statistics for you to have in mind for our discussion. Today, the world's older population, 65 or older, is 9% of the total world population of 7.9 billion, according to UN estimates this year. And it's growing at an unprecedented rate. Japan has the highest percentage of its general population over age 65 at 28%, followed by Italy at 23, and Finland, Portugal, and Greece at 22%. China has 12%, and the USA 16%. And at the other end of the scale, India has 6%, and Nigeria, 3% alone of its population are over 65 it's interesting to think that in 2045, which is a mere 24 years from now, those reaching 65 will have all grown up in the digital age, and they are known as digital natives. We, myself included, and all others are known as digital immigrants. The digital natives among us will not have the fear of technology that many people do have still today. But what will they have? On the issue of trust, a 2017 Pew Research Organization study found that while this age group is more digitally connected than ever, and four out of 10 seniors in the United States now own a smartphone, there still remain a notable digital divide between younger and older Americans. And many seniors who are older and or less are less affluent or with lower levels of educational attainment, they continue to have a very distant relationship with digital technology. But over now to our panel, and I'd like to start off our discussion by talking about digital realities, particularly now in the time of COVID, and find out from the panel how they're tackling problems in their own areas of expertise and their geography, and for each of them to speak to the issues of trust and scale and take the conversation on from there. Constanza, let's kick off the panel with you today with about two and a half minutes, and then Florence, then Arthur, and then Adrian. Thank you so much. Over to you, Constance. Perfect. Thanks a lot, lot Isabel. Um, well, so from my perspective, um, um, I'm representing uh, the situation in, in, in Germany a little bit, and uh, the digital gap here in Germany um, was a big one before COVID because actually there was no need for a lot of elderly people to involve with uh, digitals. Um, and due to the um, COVID and lockdown situation, um, more and more and more elderly people really um, started to take action in, uh, in digital activities. Um, we called it the grandmother effect, um, which is uh, basically uh, the logic of it's not worthy telling people they have to do something, but if you t show them the advantages, like if you use that tool, you will see your grand children, um, people start using it. And um, more people starting to use it really showed the, the gap here in, uh, in, in, in German and in European products. So we realized a lot of the products are not developed for elderly people, um, no matter if we're speaking about hardware or software. And um, that really is a problem um, because uh, we, we have these networks and we have a, a lack of trust between these networks. Yeah. And um, this lack of trust is um, to some extent made and created by the language that we use. And thinking about crossing the, the, the chasm, like uh, building products, building software that is working for elderly people as well, that is using the language that they need to trust the, the, the digital things. Um, for that, we really need diverse teams. And this is what we have to focus on and what we don't see yet. Just right now, we only see like the 30 or 35 year old people building the digital products. And this is a problem because they don't understand the needs of the elderly people. And um, so crossing the, the chest and closing the gap really is a leadership uh, a task. And this is what we do. Um, how can we come up with mixed teams um, in terms of gender, in terms of age, in terms of nationalities? This is a really, really, really big um, leadership task. And um, 
yeah, a question that is, that is linked to what we do um, is also maybe we should motivate more 60 or 65 year old people to found a company. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you, Florence. Well, thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Constance. And although, Isabel, you've shared um, already many data points about the landscape of the aging population throughout our world, I would like, at the risk of creating headaches for our listeners and, and my panel fellows, to share a few additional numbers as this data participated to the creation of my company, Never Take Late, um, which is based in the United States, even though um, I have a little accent from somewhere else. But there is a fascinating parallel, I believe, between the growth of older adults globally as well as the growth of digital presence in our lives. First, let's look at the growth of the older population, a phenomenon that is global, as Isabel described. Some additional statistics in the U.S. between 2008 and 2018 According to the Administration for Community Living, the population in the U.S. increased from about 39 million to about 52 million. That's a 35 percent increase over 10 years. And according to the U.S. Uh, Census Bureau, looking forward, 10 years from now, uh, people aged 65 and plus are expected to make almost a fifth of the population in the U.S. Now, if we take as a benchmark of digital market expansion, the iPhone. Between the same decade of 2008 to 2018, when we saw the older population grow by a factor of 1.3 times, the number of iPhones sold went from 11.6 million to 218 million. So instead of a 1.3 factor, we're looking at a factor of 19 times. So these two trends are clearly not merging. And that is one of the reasons we have this great panel today. Um, why is this digital access and social engagement so critical? The COVID-19 pandemic, has, as um, Constance emphasized and, and, and mentioned, has re revealed many pre-existing vulnerabilities in our societies. And the social isolation of the older adults and its disastrous health and emotional consequences is one of them. Now, I'm sorry for this additional number. I could not resist. But AARP in a report, a recent report, finds, finds that a lack of social contacts among older adults is associated with an estimated 6.7 billion in additional Medicare spending. That's about 10% of the annual U.S. budget. So in addition to the terrible emotional disaster that social isolation causes, there is also a negative impact on the medical welfare. And although the data I shared is coming from a U.S. situation, the general trend applied to many older adults and many social systems throughout the world. So why is full digital access and social engagement so difficult for the older adults? Why, why do we face this difficulty even in the case when the older adult has access to hardware, such as a tablet and affordable Wi-Fi, there is still a need uh, of instruction and education. And lifelong learning in a world with increased life expectancy is becoming a social obligation and not an option. So from our experience at Never Take Late and academic research on this topic, we list three major barriers. One, technology is too much, too complex to absorb. Two, feelings of inadequacy and comparisons between young and old toward technology, hence the, the benefits of multi-generational programs. And three, there's a lack of confidence in the ability to learn new skills at this later stage of life. So solutions to narrow the digital divide in the population, this population, will have to respond to these three barriers. And I'm looking forward to ideas to remove them and Arslan, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Excellent. Arslan. Can we, you're on mute, I think. We don't hear you. Arslan, we don't hear you. Can you? Voila. Uh, you can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Hello. Carry Hello, on. Isabel. Thank you very much for... Uh, yeah uh yeah as i think i think what 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 has been uh, already said is that there is a lack of trust uh in 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 the gro in globally there is a lack of trust 
this is what we uh, we noticed from the south perspective from the third world country uh, we have the same figures uh, somehow if i may say um, uh, regarding algeria uh, the population is 40 million people uh, 70% of the population has uh, under 30 years old which is very very important and <clears throat> And uh, the accessibility to internet, uh, the rate of accessibility to internet is 59% of the population. It is normal because we have 70% of the uh, of the population that has uh, under uh, 60 years old. Uh, what is uh, what is the uh, what are the figures um, in 2019? 77% of the users of internet are aged from uh, 15 to 42 uh, years old and 50% between 50, 45 and 54 and 70%, not 17%, uh, up to, uh, uh, up to uh, 50, years, uh, 50 years old. So the elderly uh, population is very uh, a small uh, 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 rate in terms of accessibility to internet. What 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 is what is the um, the uh, uh, regarding the the regarding the the the, um, the tradition and regarding the 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 culture of the of the country. The elderly people are are well integrated within the within the young population. This is part of our culture. The problem is that uh, more and more, because we have 70% of, of population that is young, there is uh, a sort of uh, 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 a disconnection of the el eldest uh, uh, population uh, 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 with the uh, new, uh, I mean, the, the new generation. The, the problem is not accessibility. The problem is the use of uh, the uh, IT uh, 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 IT uh, devices. The only people are somehow uh, have a fear of using this kind of 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 of, uh, of uh, devices. Uh, what uh, what could be done? Uh, uh, what could be done is maybe again. Maybe to train the elderly people to be uh, uh, to be uh, 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 to oh. the, the the devices uh, or to use to, to 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 use all these new devices. As you said, Isabel, within w w w I like the word uh, we are uh, we are immigrants. We are uh, uh, digital immigrants. Uh, 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 yes, we are digital uh, immigrants. By 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 the next uh, ten years, maybe uh, our generation will not face this kind of problem because all the 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 population will will be uh, 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 will be integrated and will use this. Um, will have the facility to use this digital uh, 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 digital uh, technology and digital uh, 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 devices. Uh, what? Yeah, the, the social, the social, the social contact. Uh, we noticed, as as this has been said, we noticed during this pandemic that there is a lack of social contacts because of digitalization, because of using of of of. Uh, of this um, this um, digital devices and and and, and technology, uh, I think from my perspective is that we have to revisit and reconsider uh, reconsider the the landscape and the use of the technology. Uh, otherwise, maybe we will face within the next few years this disconnection from the population from the uh, disconnection of, of the population and uh, this um, uh, this lack and this uh, this lack of of, of social contact, uh, the, the the COVID the pandemic uh, uh, gave us a flavor of how the people are more and more disconnected from 
the social the social arena. Uh, this is uh, this is I think this is a, a big challenge. How to uh, to get uh, 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 to get the people uh, using the technology without be disconnecting from the social arena. This is, I think, the challenge from uh, from all all of us, and and and, and it is a globally uh, a global challenge. Thank you, Thank very, you very much, much. Um, Adrian. Perhaps you'd also like to bring. Uh, I'd like to list, uh, bring in the word scale in terms of trust here in your in your opening comments, if you can, or speak to it. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, Isabel. I mean, it's uh, there's a, there's. Uh, there's a great deal that Constance and Florence and Arslan have all very, very, uh, very articulately set out. Um, I, I think what I would add would be first to, to go back to the, the data point. Um, you know, one of the problems, I think, when we're looking at, uh, at this group of older people is that they're not pr particularly well served, not only particularly well served by technology, but not really well served by measures of, uh, of how much technology is being used. Um, th there's much less, it seems to us, disaggregated data uh, around use of technology by older people than there is uh, around younger people and so on. So you know, the first challenge I think here is that if you're not counted, the risk is you don't count. Um, and so, you know, when we look at the, the, the data that is available, and there's not a lot, as I said, at a sort of a, at a, at a comprehensive level, but we can look at a number of countries. And Arslan has just set out some of this in the case of Algeria. Um, but I'm looking here at, um, at Denmark, for example, where uh, in the total population, 97% of uh, the population are online. Um, Colombia uh, has 64% of its total population online and just 11% of its over 75s. So a much uh, starker difference there. Thailand, 67% um, of its total population are online, only 5% of its over 75s are online. And, um, and I, I defer to Aslan's figures on Algeria. The figures I have for Algeria here are, um, are similar, though not perfectly the same, but that's always the way with statistics, as we know. But uh, on the figures I have, uh, around 49%, I think Aslan said it's a little bit higher than that, but about 50% about, about or so of the population online and uh, and for the over 75s it's just four percent so um you know taking those four countries as a, as a snapshot of the global picture you know we can see there is a real issue here but i think the lack of uh, of comprehensive and uh, and timely up-to-date data is perhaps something that ought to be addressed but i would say in my own opening comments then three things uh, quickly firstly we need to be conscious of these inequalities and not only in you know uh, doing a better job in 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 uh in in, in uh, figuring out the right uh, picture from data uh we need to feed through that understanding of different inequalities throughout the the policy process so that uh, relates to age as we've just touched on but it also relates to uh to gender uh, we know that you know men are more likely to be online than women 21 percent more likely according to our own figures at the, the web foundation and our research and in the least developed countries uh, something like 52 percent more likely to be online um so there's a real gender digital divide that needs to be uh needs to be addressed and there's an intersectionality of course if you are uh, an older woman in a rural area you know you're at the intersection of some 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 important uh, disadvantages that multiply each other so addressing those consciously addressing those inequalities is one step that we need to take i think secondly defining what it really means to be connected you know i think there's a there's perhaps a slightly outdated binary notion of either you're connected or you're not connected you know that it, it like it's a on off switch uh, and of course we know that's that's really not the case uh, many of us including those taking part in this in this conference are, are probably connected on multiple devices with always on connections 24 seven, um, very, very frequent, if not permanent access um, to the internet. 
Um, and, you know, on the, the, the ITU figures, you know, the guardians of the statistics on this, we are all in the same category as somebody who has very intermittent access on a uh, low quality device, not able to take full advantage of, uh, of all of the opportunities of the, of the Internet. Now, that seems a little, um, a little crude, um, at least. Now, we've been thinking at the Web Foundation about this notion of meaningful connectivity, which would take a much more nuanced view and would take into account, as you said, Isabel, skills that people have. Uh, to be able to use uh, digital technology, as well as the, uh, the, the availability of relevant content uh, in the right language and so on. Uh, and alongside that, just the more technical aspects of frequency of, of uh, connection and uh, download speeds and, and what kind of device you have and so on. And then finally, I would say um, we need a framework for action on all of these issues. And, uh, you know, we've brought something uh, launched by the web's inventor, Tim Berners-Lee, who's our founder of the Web Foundation, called the Contract for the Web, which sets out a set of things that governments need to do, companies need to do, and all of us as citizens can do in order to realize the, the, the true potential, the original vision of the web as something that should be truly for everyone, older people as well as younger people, women as well as men, uh, and so on. Um, and that if we all take those steps set out in that Contract for the Web, and it's something that's been endorsed by 1,400 or so companies, including all the, the biggest tech firms as well as lots of civil society organizations uh, and organizations around the world if we can all do the steps that are set out in that uh, in that contract then we have a chance of, of the web being truly what it was intended to be and that is something that is for everyone first of all and secondly a public good that, that one way or another serves humanity and enables us to to, uh, to to live our best lives if you like so Isabel those would be my opening thoughts thank you well wow well, everybody had a lot of great uh food for thought there. I was struck by that phrase, if you're not counted, you don't count. And when I think of the literally millions and millions that are going up for billion people over 65, if you're an economist and you're into their spending power and what they can do is in insane. And so if you don't, that is such a big market growing hugely that I hope that just even if it's just sheer economics, people will start to pay more attention to this <laughs> growing numbers of population, that's what I think. But anybody would like to, to, to um, uh, start this general conversation over, perhaps we should look at um, issues about literally connectivity of the elders to start with. And I well, welcome your views now. Anyone, just go for it. Go for it. Well, um, you know, I, I uh, thank you, Adrian, for reminding us what was the original purpose of the World Wide Web. You know, sometimes we, we are so caught in, uh, in our current lives that we, we forget the mission. And, um, and that's, I guess, again, the, the, the problem we, we pose. But I would love to hear about solutions. You know, we, a lot of us, I, uh, I, I notice shared data and numbers and, so what are the actual solutions that, um, that are out there? What, what are you, my panel fellows, and maybe the, the few people who are attending this panel as well, what are you thinking in terms of practical solutions? You know, at Never Take Late, we focused on education because we believe education for the older adults about technologies is, is critical and that's the way of the future. But this is one way of looking at it and it's one adult at a time. What about uh, you around this room? Um, what, what, are, what can we do, you know, starting tomorrow that actually will make uh, this panel in five years discuss in a very different way about the issues? So sorry to answer your question by a question. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if this is... Um if, if this is already too too deep in the topic itself, but I think that um, audio technology is a real great thing that would help us uh, close the divide. Um, uh, because uh, for me, it really looks like that um, we can jump from this step of education in the in the tech world to this. With, without knowing all the all the stuff in the middle, you know. Um, so I really, really, really believe that audio technology is a great thing that we should be um, focusing in uh, development, yeah, and uh, bringing this to a broader 
um, uh, yeah, broader uh, group of people by media, advertising, uh, educational content, things like that. Yeah, um, and um, yeah, I think that the twenty twenties will be the um, the decade of audio. Very interesting, because look at how radio used to be just totally ubiquitous everywhere, and it still is. And whereas like people are almost coming back to records, now they're coming back to audio is very big. And I think it also helps for, for the people who are illiterate, and there are millions and millions and millions of people, alas, around the world who still cannot read or write. So this kind of thing, and also how to, visual technology can help as well, so to avoid the writing component or the reading component. And it's and it's really a question of usability, right? And if I'm if I'm thinking of the um, uh, Amazon Alexa, yeah, it, it's really like only one button that you have to to push, and this button is quite big and things like that. It's really that simple. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry that Arslan seems to have dropped off. I hope he comes back on because uh, that was one of his issues: was the um, the percentage of his population that were still. Uh, unable to read and write, so this was, this kind of thing is very good. Would be really important for him and for other countries like that. And I, I would I would add, um, Isabel, I, and uh, I'm always pleased when we're talking about radio because that was my my first career and many, many <laughs> years ago. Now I spent five years as a local radio presenter when I first got out of school um, on the south coast of England, which uh, was you know what happened. Welcome back, Arsene. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> it is Arsene. Awesome. Um, uh, but I, um, well, you know, we, I absolutely agree on the power of uh, of not just radio but more broadly audio and and, and voice. Um, and and yet also see how you know much of our technologies are, are, are still not fully harnessing perhaps the right ways to use um, uh, audio. I mean, I, I know from my own experience, and I'm sure many of us have this experience myself with a, an older relative uh, trying to during this pandemic to to help to help her to be you know connected to family and so on, um, and uh, and. You know, Constance said earlier, you're absolutely right that there, you know, there's nothing better than the power of um, uh, of a of an incentive like being able to talk to the grandchildren and so on. I 100% agree with that. And yet, even even though you know some things about these technologies, whether it's Alexa or whatever, are very uh, are apparently very intuitive. Um, you know, I've seen at least in my own uh, experience with family members that um, they they sometimes. They ought to be intuitive, and yet sometimes, somehow, they're, they're, they're not always, you know. And for a, for a person of a certain age, um, just the way that you have to communicate with the device is not not actually as intuitive as you, as you think, and it's, and it's hard to get used to, you know, not having to shout and things like that. You know, lots of little things which, uh, you know, and Constance, you've talked before about this, you know, about how many of these issues perhaps are in the, the design stage with, with the companies and the industries that produce these these products and these these tools, um, and if you know, if most of uh, the tools that we use are designed by you know a thirty-year-old uh, from California um, who might be a particular profile in, in other ways too, then um, you know we're we're probably not going to um, to find that those those products are as as usable uh, and as relevant to. People who are different from that profile, whether they're older, different gender, different uh, mm -hmm. group, and so on. You know, so that does feel like it's something where we could make, make some, some good progress. And I think some progress is being made, but there's certainly a long way to go. Um, Florence had talked about her. And she's touching people one by one, almost, just to get them to be trained and so forth. And this can happen. This always happens. But in parallel, what do the panel think about these issues of scale, both of trust? And like literally scaling the technology so they can reach across. You know, this, I guess, has to do with connectivity itself, which is part of scale. But I am just uh, want to come back to the issues of, of trust, scaling trust, which is part of this panel's discussion. And I'm wondering if you have further thoughts on that, anyone? Well, I, I do, if I may. <laughs> so... Um, one of the themes that we are talking about is lifelong learning. I mean, whatever we do, I think it's going to be very difficult to deliver a technology uh, solution that the older adult can immediately embrace. And even if we do, then in three months, it will be outdated by uh, you know software updates or others. So I think in terms of scaling, um, 
we have to go back to lifelong learning and education. And we tend to stop uh, in our society education once you leave the workplace, right? There's no more school, there's no more continuing education. And yet our life expectancy has increased in general and depending upon countries by two or three decades. So not learning during this time of life is sort of a really paradoxical situation. So I think scaling will involve teaching and not only technology, but targeting the, the older population as still a population that needs to enjoy the benefits of education. And then in terms of trust, this is really important because we, we've spoken about the benefits of technology, but you know there's two sides to the coin. And the other side of technology is um, the, the other side and the risk of technology among others is cybersecurity. And once you open that door, you know it's another door for all the adults to potentially be abused and defrauded. And, and research has proven that as we age, we tend to trust more, which is not always a benefit. So I think the, the, the issue of cyber security education is very important when we are going to open that door. Uh, and, and maybe others want to um, comment on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, excellent. Uh, Arslan, since you come from the security arena, would you like to comment on FAS, <laughs> what she's just said about cyber security for adults and scaling and so forth? Oops. Can you can you hear us? Uh, I can. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Fine. Yeah. yeah uh, you. Uh, I fully agree. There is this uh, this this issue of cyber security, and uh, uh, and more and more uh, uh, the, the the problem is how to train and how to uh, raise awareness among this population uh, about cyber uh, cyber uh, security. The adults. Are not aware how, how how to deal with this with this issue, and uh, we have a concept uh, in security that we can use a science technology. Uh, so, sorry, science diplomacy to raise awareness among the population regarding the cybersecurity and the threat that they could be uh, faced uh, in using uh, digital uh, uh, devices or or, or uh, technology. So uh, again, the challenge for the for the next few uh, few years is not only how to integrate this this these adults within within our uh, social arena, but also to raise among them the uh, the awareness uh, about the security and um, about the uh, cyber security and all the threats that could be uh, they could be faced uh, in using technology. Uh, it's 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 really a challenge. It's a big challenge, and it is uh, not a challenge uh, 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 which our countries, third world countries, are facing. But it's also a challenge that uh, the uh, the industrial countries are also facing. It's it's a global challenge. In in addition to cybersecurity, I want to um, add one more thing um, out of my level of expertise in, in, in company building. What I really believe in uh, is that we have to change the attitude that, that, that we are in um, to uh, really scale trust. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, thinking about organizations, thinking about institutions, political institutions, thinking about companies, um, we really had this attitude of um, defining what we are doing from our perspective and um, then doing something and pushing it to the market. And the shift that has to be seen to uh, scale trust is that we have to build and have to act in a human-centered way, meaning really looking at the market, talking to the people. So politics need to talk to people. Companies need to talk to their clients. They have to understand um, what their clients are thinking, what their clients need, um, what their employees need. And um, really changing the way how we build organizations, how we build uh, companies will help to come up with better products and will help to come up um, with more people trusting um, what, what happens in the world there.
That, that's very good. And it points to yeah. what you also said uh, earlier, Constance, when you said that companies need to be made up of much more wider people, both no, women, older, younger, etc. Because without it, it just, you get a terribly narrow view of the universe. things uh, in addition to what's already been said I think you know trust needs confidence that those who have responsibility exercise that responsibility uh, as they should so you know dealing with some of the obvious harms and risks uh, of uh, of technology that some of which we talked about threats to cyber security but also um, you know disinformation online um, harassment and and uh, and indeed uh, violence online directed towards women or to, to, towards particular groups. Uh, those are harms that need to be addressed and there are things that governments can do and things that companies can do to address them. But I, I think there's also another thing that, that breeds trust at scale and that's uh, and that's hard and it's sort of nuanced and it's the existence of a set of kind of norms of behaviour and expectations of each other uh, and habits, if you like, um, which in our offline world we've had centuries arguably to to develop you know we we there are certain behaviors and sort of courtesies that most of us will observe as we walk down the street and for the few that don't they generally get called out or they should um and it's no surprise that in our online world which is such a shorter life of 10 15 years or so um we haven't figured out some of those things yet and then again with this contract for the web that we've been doing the web foundation that's one of the reasons why we tried to have a, a citizens component for that too because i think there are commitments that we can all make in how we uh, you know engage courteously and respectfully with each other uh how we um, look out for misinformation or hate and so on online and call it out and there are things that we can all do in that respect um, you know which will make the web a, a, a better place for everybody including for older people but, uh, but for, the, for the whole of humanity good point very good point um Could, go ahead sorry who was speaking just then was that okay asking? can i add something of course yeah this yeah this is me yeah uh, uh I think I think the, the 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 young generation have has to understand that we are human being and we are not androids. <laughs> uh, this is this is very important. Uh, yeah, because when you talk to the to the young generation, to the very young generation, they think that they that this uh, this adults are 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 really androids are really uh, 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 and 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 they think uh, and this is the problem that uh, there is a miscommunication between the two the two generations uh, the two big generations a lack of communication lack of dialogue as you already said is 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 uh, is, um, is, is here i mean it's we are noticing this so building trust and confidence is key but through dialogue we ha we have to to uh, to help to break this uh, this disconnection that it is between the eldest generation and the new generation, and it is our responsibility. But it's it is also the responsibility of of, of the young generation. We are not androids, definitely. <laughs> Um, I also think, actually, that just as, you know, women really have made strides breaking into what shall we say, you know, the co companies at corporate level by having boards have to have women on their boards. I think they should have to have people who are over 50 years old on their board, like a mandatory, so that you start to get people involved, whether you quote unquote like it or not. And I think it would, it may help because the realities are that that companies that are making products, building products, have to have a, a, a better idea and perhaps some uh, guidance as to, to help them look at the elder generation as something that is of value, continuing value. And that speaks to this lifelong learning, Constance, that you said. I think I couldn't agree with you more. We learn all our lives. And that is something that needs to be uh, more recognized, I think, in, in, in all spaces across the world, actually.
So I have some interesting things that I've looked at. We've still got possibly about another eight or nine minutes to go. Um, I love this term, the grandmother effect. That struck me. That scaling should be lifelong learning and shouldn't just stop at college. Absolutely. And how to change attitudes to scale trust. And the shift of that is to have to build, is to build it in human centered ways. And as Adrian said, that trust also needs confidence. You don't have, if you don't have confidence in who is, who is exercising responsibility and who's setting norms of behavior and habits, it won't work either. And so those are some of the keys that stand out for me, as well as audio technology, actually, for, for adults over 65. Anybody else have some things that have stood out for you from this conversation? Pretty, pretty good, um, good wrap-up of the session. That you <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think the word dialogue is really, really, really important. Yes. I also think that, that what I've really enjoyed about this conversation is there's a real sense of optimism that uh, whatever the challenges are that we've some, many of which we've identified that there's an optimism that we can we can overcome them and and that's really refreshing I think you know and and it's easy to sort of fall into a sense of pessimism or, 